Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Matthew Palomari back with us. Author, editor, shamanic explorer. His adventures have taken him through the mountains, deserts, and jungles of North, Central, and South America, pursuing his studies of shamanism and visionary experiences working with plant medicines. Matthew, you've been busy. Yes, sir. I am, George. Thank you. Good to have you back with us. How have you been? I've been great. As you said, super busy, um, keeping my nose down and my butt up, working away. Traveling still? Yes, sir. Almost too much. Um, but you can never complain. you got to get it while you can get it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, tonight we're going to talk about consciousness and your two books. And let's talk about the two books that have come out. Which came out first uh, this year, The Thinning Veil or The I Am Consciousness Incarnate? The, the Thinning Veil came out first. I was actually writing the two in parallel because um, I was working on the I Am Consciousness Incarnate. I actually started it. I got the inspiration for it of all times at Christmas Eve. And then um, one of my fans was bugging me. He's like, okay, we love your nonfiction, but how about some more stories? So I was doing the, the stories kind of in between, and it's nice to change off between two different projects kind of to get a break from each one and yep. you know, keep it flowing. It is refreshing. Now, in your opinion, what is your definition of consciousness? So... Um, in my opinion, in the end, consciousness has to do with awareness. And, and it's our individual awareness of our thoughts and our memories, our feelings, our sensations, and our environments. It's awareness of ourselves and the world around us. And it's a, it's a subjective experience that's unique to each one of us. So if, if we can describe uh, something that we are experiencing in words, then it's part of our consciousness. And it's interesting because it constantly shifts and changes. You, 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 right in one moment, you could be listening to me talk right now, and the next, next you may shift over to thinking about a uh, conversation you had with a friend or your, you know, your previous guest there. Or you might suddenly think about how uncomfortable the chair you're sitting in is, or you start, might, might start thinking about what's going to be for dinner. You know, it shifts very quickly and dramatically from one, one moment to the next, and yet there's a continuity to it. Um, it, it feels very smooth and effortless as we as we flow through it. Is it related to the brain or is it outside of the brain? I love questions like that. I would say yes. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because um, we are the seat of consciousness, so to speak. And how we experience the world has to do with our perceptions. And so we we have the experiences that come to us through our five senses. But we also have what, what comes from within us. You know, there's the expression a priori, which is how you think about something sort of before it happens. Like you can have a priori concept of house, and then you look and you see a house, and those two connections make it become real for you, you know, in your experience. They, there's tons of theories <clears throat> excuse me, um, about where consciousness resides within the brain, mm -hmm. but they're all theories. Because the brain is a very complex network, um, and it's interconnected in many ways. So you can't really pin it down to one place because it, it, it's very evasive. It's very mercurial. Um, it, it moves around. And then there are tons of different definitions of consciousness. And where does the subconscious fit in, Matthew? <clears throat> so the subconscious um, kind of lies below everything else, and much of it comes through in how we talk. It's, it's closely related to our conscious mind, but it's the things that we're not really thinking about in the moment, but we can draw into our conscious awareness very quickly. Things that we don't want to look at necessarily or see are repressed into the unconscious minds. I know you and I have talked a bit in the past about uh, shadow work. Yeah. 
and you know shadow work is the the things within ourselves that we consider to be um, unacceptable, but there are good things and bad things that are in there and and you could have an experience a traumatic experience that sends you into shock, and your mind will automatically block it out, just like you know if you get into a nasty car accident, you may not feel anything because your mind it's a, it's a survival mechanism that's right so um it can come into into our awareness when we need it. Like we, right now, we may not be thinking about doing long division. But if we go, oh, I want to do long division, we can immediately go to that information and bring it into our conscious awareness and solve a math problem. There are other things. There are memories, um, other things we can access. And this happens a lot, obviously, being a writer, where we can go to those places. And, and being a writer... You have to learn to work with your subconscious. You have to learn how to feed it and then basically forget about it. And then it will deliver sometimes when you're taking a shower, sometimes in a dream. But you learn to work with it and you learn to trust it. It has all the stuff that's not immediately uh, available to us in the moment because if, if we had everything that went on in our brains happening at once, we would be completely incoherent. We couldn't handle it all. No, not at all. You know, we don't think I can. We can suddenly take control of our breath, but breathing is really an unconscious process. Our heartbeat, our body temperature, all of the things that regulate keeping us alive, we don't consciously think about. There's that whole part of our mind that takes care of those things for us, which allows us to be very present and in the moment, so that we can function. You know, with all this information, and we have to funnel the information that we get in order to remain coherent. Otherwise, we're just simply overwhelmed by everything. The late uh, psychologist uh, William James talked about human consciousness, and he said there were five major characteristics. What are they? Yeah. William James is one of my favorite heroes of all time. Um, he was brilliant. And he says that um, kind of what I was just saying just, just now, that home, human consciousness it flows like a stream. And it's characterized by uh, streams of thought being governed by these five characteristics. So the first one is that every thought tends to be part of a personal consciousness. The second one is that within each personal consciousness, thought is always changing. The third is that within each personal consciousness, thought is sensibly continuous. The fourth is that it always appears to deal with objects independent of itself. And the last one is that it is interested in some parts of these objects to the exclusion of others. So those are the five primary characteristics that he uh, observed. Do, do some people naturally use their conscious not minds and subconscious minds without really even trying yeah, I, I think generally speaking, um, intuition is one of the greatest examples of that. And some people have more uh, intuition and awareness than other people in certain situations. And some people have more knowledge of one area than in another. So I always, you know, not getting into politics, but I always like to say if you go far enough right, you're going to end up left. And if you go far enough left, huh. you're going to end up right. You just go in a circle. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it all, and it does, it all kind of goes full circle. And there are things that we can do intuitively um, that we don't really have to think about. And anybody who has studied, you know, writing in many respects is one of them. But anybody who's a musician, you know, like um, I'm a musician, I'm a vocalist, I've also studied and practiced martial arts. Um, great sports uh, players, um, they don't have to think about what they're doing. There's an expression uh, among scientists and psychologists, they basically say uh, neurons that fire together wire together. So in, in my case, um, among other things, I'm a drummer. So I learned to practice, there's the 26 drum rudiments, and you learn to practice them. And in the, in the beginning, you have to think about what you're doing, and you make it happen. And then the more you do it, the more you don't have to think about it. And then, of course, when it's time to play music, you forget about all that and you just play. And, um, 
years ago when I was first studying martial arts, my sensei was saying that the ideal condition would be to be in a uh, in a fight and be knocked unconscious and still being able to fight because your body knows what to do. <laughs> so I always kind of like that idea. And, you know, same thing about, when, you know, other different physical skills as examples. If you learn to ride a bicycle, you got to really pay attention to what you're doing. But once you learn how to do it, you forget. You just get on the bike and you ride. With that old saying, it's like riding a bicycle. That's where those cliches come from because they're great. <laughs> I was talking about artificial intelligence. Is that going to play a part in any of this? Yes and no. Um, I also, nowhere near uh, the background um, of your previous guest, Bart, right? Yeah, Costco, um, Bart Costco. Yeah, but I, but I have um, a background in technology. And so, you know, one of the things Bart was saying was that the massive amount of computing power you need for artificial intelligence is to learn to train it. And the more you feed it all this different information, it learns and then it responds. But it can never really have emotion. Um, you know, it can emulate it. It can be polite, but it can't change physical sensations. It can't really smell. It can't feel in the heart. It can't uh, really admire what is it like to look at a beautiful rose or to smell a beautiful rose. You know, it can't go down the street like we go down the street and suddenly see a beautiful woman and your heart stops because she's so beautiful, right? Um, it can't do any of those things, but I like to think of it as a very complex tool. And it's an extension of our consciousness because, uh, like, like Bart said, it is, um, it's, it's doing what we're asking it to do, and it's extending itself to, to follow. He, he used a great term about human, I forget how he put it, but it was like human error, or uh, human agents, I think is the word that he used, the expression he used. Mm -hmm. So we can use it as an extension. It can certainly do wonderful things, but... Um, it can't have those spontaneous emotional things. It can't shift like we shift in the stream of consciousness from moment to moment. It can only copy what we do and how we direct it. It's just like you can see a house and you can build a house and you can use all the tools to build a house, but you're the one that's doing the building. You know, you, you can you can program computers to carve beautifully pieces of wood with laser and all of those things, but there's nothing like that hands-on feeling of old-school artistry and carpentry and, and, you know, sculpting and things like that that we do as humans. You talk about animal and plant consciousness. Tell me about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated with that, particularly because of my uh, experiences that I've had in the jungle. and. People could say, well, that person is as dumb as a house plant. But I'm not so sure that the house plant is so dumb, and maybe they're even smarter than us. And, you know, there's that, there's that whole thing about how maybe plants are cultivating us because they were there before we were. And there's this whole symbiotic relationship between um, plants and humans and, and other things. So the whole idea of animal consciousness excuse me, poses a problem of other minds because non-human animals don't have the ability to express human language and they can't tell humans about their experiences. So you can't really have uh, objective reasoning about that question because the denial that an animal is consciousness implies it doesn't feel and it, that its life has no value and that harming it is not morally wrong. Descartes has <laughs> often been blamed for, for mistreating animals because he believed that only humans have a non-physical mind. And most people believe that animals like cats and dogs are conscious, but insects are not. But the source of this is based on personal interactions with pets and other animals that have been subjectively observed. So if you think that subjective experience is the essence of consciousness, then the nature of con uh, animal consciousness, we can't really know. If insects have subjective experiences, then they have to embody the essence of consciousness. 
do, do bees like the taste of nectar? Do ants foraging for crumbs feel better when they find one? Everyone agrees that bees can take in environmental information and perform impressive computations on it, but can they feel and sense the environment from a person perspective? Just because they can't articulate it in human language doesn't mean they're not conscious. Where does consciousness come from in the first place, Matthew? It comes from within us. Are we, we are, are we born with it, or do we inherit it? I think we're born with it. Um, I think we come into awareness initially in the womb or whenever we come into this plane of existence. And we are evolving. So when we first come into feeling and knowing and experiencing, we're d definitely connected to our mothers in the womb. But we can't articulate things. We don't know what's going on until suddenly things start to change in the womb and we end up into the world, and then we start to learn as we go. But if you, if you go down to the basics of defining consciousness as awareness, then the moment you have any sort of awareness within the womb is the beginning of consciousness. And, of course, the more you evolve and the bigger your brain gets and the more your sensory organs evolve, the more input you have, and the more your consciousness can evolve and develop and become more aware. And, in, you know, in shamanism and on the spiritual paths throughout the world, in the end it's all about growing awareness and becoming more aware. If somebody's working towards becoming enlightened, so to speak, then they're becoming more aware of things. And, of course, the more aware you become, the more conscious you become, and the better and the wiser and the better decisions that you can make, you know, within yourself and within the world and within, uh, you know, the people around you. Does consciousness make successful people? I think yes. But um, I think consciousness in terms of success is also a subjective thing. Uh, a guy can have, uh, you know, six gazillion dollars, and, and in the ways of the world of money, he could be considered to be very successful. But he could be the unhappiest people, one of the unhappiest people in the world. That's possible. That's true. You you could have a shaman in the jungle who who has no physical possessions, and he's happy. He's happy. He's like he walks ten feet, and there's the banana tree, and there's his banana, and he goes over there, and there's he's got his well at his fingertips. And he's got his little hut and everything else. That's right. And he's got he's got no insurance. <laughs> he doesn't have the IRS, right? And you know. Uh, he doesn't have air pollution, all of the things that come with society and all the material possessions that people spend their lives after. He has none of it, and he doesn't want it, and he doesn't need it because he's really happy with who he is and where he is because he's, you know, he's in the, he's in the, the, the palm, in the heart of Mother Earth, and all his needs are met. Thinning veil. What does that title mean, Matthew? Well, it means that as we move forward in time and progress, uh, if that's a good word, that the, the differences between the worlds it really seems to be shifting and thinning. So my first short story collection, The Small Dark Room of the Soul, came out 30 years ago. And, um, you know, art reflects life, and life reflects art. And in those three decades since that first came out, the world has changed drastically. You know, oh my God, yeah. the politics have radically changed. Science and technology have exploded. Now we've had pandemics and school shootings and you know chaotic weather patterns and homelessness. So I, I didn't realize it until after the book was published, but The Small Dark Room of the Soul um, was actually an examination of the human shadow. And I was uh, very blessed because uh, I got a blurb on that book from one of you and I, one of our favorite people, Ray Bradbury. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and Ray was very, very good to me um, in supporting me in, in what I was doing. Then 20 years after that, my second short story came out. I called it A Short Walk to the Other Side because I was thinking, okay, all of the horrible things that happen, serial killers or whatever, well, we're all human. And so... Any one of us are capable of that. 
and you'd you know, you'd read all these literal horror stories about oh he you know there's this crazy serial killer guy and oh he was the nicest guy in the world and all that right you know John Wayne Gacy was running around dressing up as a clown and helping out little kids and all that mm-hmm. so I th- and the theme of that was it's just a short walk boom over to the other side and then when I kept thinking about it when I came out with this third collection here um, I was thinking back to how in our society and in Western thought, we separate dreaming and waking and visions and sleep, just sound sleep. We separate them all. I'm awake, I'm asleep, blah, blah, blah. But in indigenous societies, they don't see any separation at all. They see it as a, um, as a continuum. So dreams and visions in the waking worlds they're all different degrees of one and the same all-encompassing reality, and it ties in with this this stream of consciousness, and it, and it goes forward. So I was thinking about how the world has changed and how the differences between those worlds have become blurred, and it's my belief and observation that with, you know, with the advent of how ubiquitous the Internet has become, it has accelerated that whole process. You know, you can have a thought about something and put it on the Internet and, you know, seconds later, some guy from Russia can go, oh, yeah, I I have that same thought. And you can, you know, do all this work in between with this sort of um, acceleration. So I feel as if everything is speeding up. And the more it's speeding up and the boundaries that we believe that we have between things are becoming more and more blurred. And and certainly when I spend all the time in the jungle, And I'm working with the plants, and I'm doing these very rigorous shamanic plant diets, working with with ayahuasca and numerous other plants that they've been working with since prehistoric times. The world kind of all blurs together, and and you you not only are experiencing the jungle externally, but you're sort of experiencing it internally. I like to say you get a tour of the jungle from the inside out. It's all connected, and you get to see how, you know, there's the bugs – and then the animals eat the bugs, and then the animals die, and then the trees grow from from that, and you know, then the trees grow up, and then the animals eat from the trees, and then the trees die, and the cycle just goes on and on and on. It's really a wonderful symphony um, of of nature and cooperation that that you know we as a species are destroying, you know. So uh, to me, I see it all connected. And it's all a matter of a continuum. And, and we're all connected to each other, whether we like it or not. What one person does can influence other people. You know, one horrible mass shooting. And how many lives does that affect? And then you look at, you know, the, the wars that are going on right now and all, all the poor people that are getting, you know, their lives are destroyed and upended because of all this craziness, right? Yeah. So to me, it's just all thinning and it's speeding up. And I also think that... Um, the weather patterns and the global warming um, stuff, I think it's all related. And I think we're all going through this process. I th- and I think in the end it's a type of uh, purification. Now the subtitle to the Thinning Veil is 13 Twisted Tales. Yes. Now tell me about that subtitle. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I started off writing horror and science fiction and then, I'm, and then I thought to myself at one point, what am I writing this stuff for? And then I thought, well, you know, it's a reflection of humanity. It is. And then I thought, as my path has progressed and I started getting more into, you know, I've been going into the jungle now for 25 years. And so I, my writing has become more spiritual. So I want to tell the stories because in the end, really great stories are all really morality tales. One of the things I loved and one of the biggest influences all of my writing has been the Twilight Zone. They were all morality tales. And if you watch the old, you know, I I, I sat and I watched all the old Alfred Hitchcock shows, and they were Mm -hmm. all basically, in one way or another, the theme is that crime does not pay. Right. So I wanted to look at contemporary times, and I spent a lot of time scanning the news to see things that were going on. You know, part of the discussion um, about uh, AI that, that, that you just had had to do with the fact that 
there are the human agents and things can get out of control and it can, you know, the whole concept of AI hallucinating and the fact that we've embraced technologies without realizing the consequences of it and the things that have happened with the Internet that we had no idea would ever happen. I mean, some years back, um, I got my identity stolen while I was in the jungle. How'd that happen? You know, I finally figured it out. I was flying through, and I got on the Internet at the Detroit airport, maybe for five minutes just to check on something. My hometown, by the way. Oh, well, somebody got in there, and they got my stuff, and I was in the jungle, out of touch with everything. for Not, not knowing what was going on, right? Exactly, for two weeks. So when I, I get off, first my Internet wouldn't work at the Lima Airport in Peru. And then I get off in LAX, and there's like eight messages on my phone from, you know, fraud department from my credit card on my credit card. Oh, my God. All that stuff. And <clears throat> what I figured is that they, 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 they hacked into my stuff, they got into my credit cards, and then they were paying minimal payments on my credit cards from so my the, checking account. So they were using them? Oh, yeah, and then they were running them up. But to the to my credit union and the credit card company's credit, I said, look, I've been in the jungle off, literally off the grid and off the map, out of completely out of touch for two weeks. You can see right here, and they're like, yes, sir, you're correct. And so I ended up eventually um, getting it all squared away, but I had to go redo everything and all that. Yeah, the funny part is, is I had had a very intense... I mean, all the jungle diets are intense, but I had had a particularly intense one that time. And when I came back and all that stuff hit and all whatever money I had was gone, I was totally zen about it. I was like, oh, well, what are you going to do, right? You got it all back, though, didn't you? I did get it all back. It, it took some doing. Yeah. It's a hassle. Yeah, it's a hassle. And, it, you know, I always like to say it's life in the 21st century, right? Um. So all of our conveniences of online banking and this and that has dangers. It does. How have you used consciousness for yourself? For me, I've explored it in every way possible. I know you and I, three or four uh, uh, episodes ago, we were talking about it. When I was a kid, anything I could do to alter my consciousness, I did. To me, all those things were in the world, and there are ways of exploring. And, of course, there are good things and bad things, and everything is, is subject to abuse anyway. Yeah. So I wanted to explore, and through all of the uh, my research, both inner and outer, I eventually came across, uh, I know you and I had talked about him briefly before, too, is Terrence McKenna. Mm-hmm. And the fact that, that a visionary experience could be related to spirituality was an alien concept to me. And when I thought, wow, that, that people can actually have that. And then I started getting deeper into my studies of shamanism and finding these indigenous cultures in the jungle. And, you know, and even the Maya um, were very much a mushroom-based culture. And all these other cultures throughout the world that had their visionary experience. And then I realized that... <clears throat> Visionary experience and revelations are all highly subjective and highly personal. So I could be talking to you right now, and I could be having an ecstatic vision of God and the universe and the cosmos, and you would have no idea. What is your concept of God, Marsh? My concept of God is the ultimate great mystery. It's the reality. And um, when I talked about, we talked about my other book, um, The Holographic Cosmic Man, I believe that the entire universe is within us, and we are within we are within it, and it is within us. We are a drop of water in the ocean, and we are also the ocean. So I believe that everything is all connected, and this is the things I have seen in my experiences in the jungle. And so if I look, everybody around me is really me. They're all reflections of me. And one of the great things of shadow work is that anybody in our lives – that does anything that really drives us crazy and upsets us, and we find ourselves judging, that's actually our shadow. And we're, and we're seeing that reflection. And when you continue on this path and you really work on digging out your shadow and really working hard to become a better person, then those darker aspects of who you are and those people in your life will fall away. 
and new people will come into your life, and you will see that you are all of them, and you'll get better reflections than what you had in the beginning because you are becoming more aware and you're knowing what to look for and you're supporting those more positive aspects of who you are as opposed to the negative ones. When I see everybody, no matter where I see them, I don't care who they are. If I see a guy in the janitor cleaning the toilet, I say to him, yes, sir. I treat them with respect. Yeah, I'm the same way. Yeah, yeah, because it's that's me. I'm looking at myself, whether I think so or not. And I have now, you know, I, a lot of younger people come to me, and I mentor, I have been for years, mentoring younger people. And I look at them, and I see some of the things they're doing, and I'm, and I'm part of me is laughing inside, not in a mean way, but I'm laughing because I'm like, there I am 20 years ago, right? And there I am 30 years ago. And I can see what they're going through because I've, I've been through it, and I finally figured out that piece of the puzzle. The other part of this that I find beautiful is that it's infinite, and it never ends. And I know you and I have discussed this before, but in, in shamanism and in ancient cultures, our heart is the center of our universe. And the sun in the middle of our solar system is energy, and it's unconditionally giving energy. And it supports life as we know it. It wouldn't exist without that being there. So in shamanism and in ancient Egyptian thoughts, the, the sun that is the center of our being, our heart, is connected to the sun at the center of our solar system, is connected to a bigger one, to a bigger one, to a bigger one, all the way back to source. Can you train yourself to develop your consciousness to do incredible things? Absolutely. Um, and there are numerous ways. For me, I'm stubborn and I'm known as a hardhead. So the plant medicines and the psychedelics that I've worked with um, have been my path. But that's not for everybody. And a lot of people don't need to do that. You can really cultivate it through meditation, through yoga, and, and just doing straight on um, shadow work. I've learned to integrate regular shadow work, focused shadow work, with the visionary experiences of ayahuasca and other things. It's the same, all paths lead to Rome. It's the same thing, it's just different approaches and different ways of going about it and doing it. But if it, developing consciousness and the spiritual path, what uh, Carlos Castaneda, the Don Juan, anybody who's ever read those books, he called becoming a man of knowledge or a man or a woman of knowledge. And in shamanism, it's called the power path. And all it really has to do with is increasing your awareness. And it gets back to the continuum of what I was talking about. In many respects in shamanism, there's really no such thing as evil. There's just levels of consciousness. If you're doing all these dark evil things, it's because you really don't know any better. I was going to say, does consciousness make you a better person? I think so, because if, if you develop consciousness, then what you're doing is you're developing awareness. And the more awareness that you develop and cultivate, the more aware you become, the better you're going to do. If, if, if you have, this is a bad example. I'm, I'm full of bad examples. <laughs> but Twisted um, tales. Yeah. If you, you're walking along and you see a spider and you're afraid and you step on it because you don't know any better, because you're afraid of the spider, that's one thing. But if you are more, more aware and you realize that that spider has its place in nature and it's serving a purpose in the bigger picture, you're going to step aside and not step on that spider. You're going to give it the opportunity to live and do its function, you know, within nature. That's interesting that you would say that. Oh, I love spiders because I hate flies. <laughs> flies and mosquitoes, huh? Yeah, it's mosquitoes too, right? All the little the noceums and the bugs and all that. I mean, but, mosquitoes don't have a place as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> No, well, there's a point where you've got to be merciless. And, and, you know, in the jungle, when I've had to deal with some things and I've, and I've killed some bugs because they were going to eat me alive, then I say to myself, wow, thank you for giving me the honor of allowing me to escort you into the next dimension because you're bugging me in this one. Exactly. Where do you get the books, Matthew? Well, they're, they're all available on Amazon, and they're um, both available as e-books, tree books, and audio books. And they can also go to uh, my website if anybody wants something personalized. And, that, and that's um, my publishing website, which is mysticinkpublishing.com. It's M-Y-S-T-I-C-I-N-K, 
T-U-B-L-I-S-H-I-N-G dot com. How did the shamans know what they knew? You know, that's one of the great mysteries. You know, one of the things, when you go into the jungle, and everything's green, and everything looks pristine. Fact, the same. In yeah. fact, the, the Spanish conquistadors would call it the green hell. And when you get deep into the jungle, the horizon is green, and you don't even know, you know, <clears throat> which end is up. That's true. <clears throat> so one of the great mysteries, particularly about ayahuasca, is in all the thousands of plants that are in the jungle. Ayahuasca is a combination of two specific plants to get that experience. How did they know to mix those two particular plants in that particular way to get that particular experience? Trial and error? I think that has to do with it. There are a lot of mythologies. And, of course, when you're in the jungle... And all you have is the plants, particularly all along, but going back to prehistoric times. You have to figure out your own pharmacology. If somebody gets hurt, how do they find it out that this plant does that? Like there's one, one plant particularly I like. It's called sangre de grado. It's actually Spanish is sangre de drago, blood of the dragon. Sounds like a wine. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> But the Indians couldn't pronounce, so they, they couldn't quite pronounce sangre de drago, so they pronounce it sangre de grado. But you go to this plant, it's a tree, and you slice the bark. It looks like birch bark. You slice it, and it literally, the sap bleeds like red. Wow, like blood. Like blood. You put your finger in that, it's sticky, and you put that on a wound, and it has latex in it, and it's also antibacterial. So if you get a cut and you're worried about an infection, you can go to this tree, you cut it, you get the blood, you put it on, and you take it. And they also use it, you know, for women with hemorrhaging problems, and they can, you can water it down for ulcers. So there is that. There's also the whole thing, I'm sure you've heard of this, and some of the listeners have heard of this, where you look at what a particular plant looks like, and it will help that particular part of the organ. The, the best example I can think of off the top of my head is they say that walnuts are the greatest brain food. And they look like brains. Exactly. So there's a lot of that identification within jungle. And uh, some years back, I was working with a mentor to the shamans I was working with. And he said, um, I am a plant man. And my father was a plant man. And his father was a plant man before him. And it goes all the way back to prehistory. So there's had to be trial and error. But it's interesting because some of the things that you, you learn that they know within this ancient um, shamanism, in this day and age, this modern day of the 21st century, and they're coming up and going, oh, we've had this great discovery. And the shamans are like, what are you talking about, man? We've known that for thousands of years. That's right. And I bet they experimented on their own populations, though. Oh, sure uh, they can did. you imagine the guy who got the poison plant before they figured out it was poison? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's one particular plant. They say, I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head. It may come to me. But they say that if you ingest that plant, then you're taking the dark path. You're gone. And once you take the dark path, there's no turning back. And when you look at this thing, it's like all these nasty-looking spikes coming out of it. It's like this, it's a palm kind of a short palm thing, but all these nasty spikes are coming out of it, and nothing else uh, will grow around it within a few feet of it. But the other thing that they, they have done is that they observe what the animals eat, and they observe the effects on animals, and then they get a sense that this plant may help in some way. There, there, there are lots of stories about them observing uh, jaguars eating ayahuasca and having, you know, uh, experiences and acting different. So that gave them a hint. And there are other plants that are used. They know that the animals won't go near that one, so there must be a reason for that. And then if the animals are eating a lot of this one, then they must know that must be a good one. And then, you know, plants do different things, whether they're good or not. Like um, some of the best pineapple I've ever had is it grows in the jungle there in, in the Amazon. 
and it's not as sweet as like what you get from you know like dull um you know from Hawaii dull pineapples it's it's sweet but it's really yummy sweet it's not overly sweet yeah and then you know there's bananas everywhere and of course uh coconuts are everywhere they'll they'll throw stuff up in the trees and knock the coconuts down and whack off the top I wonder how many people they killed off though within their own uh, tribe oh well there are different things that have happened you know one of the things i found fascinating there are there are tribes who would only allow uh, couples to have one kid. Sounds like China. But the reason they were doing it is because they were getting raided by other tribes, and they could only pick up one kid and run with it. That so, was still savage, though. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, but it, it was a survival mechanism that, that, they, that they developed. And um, a lot of the things that we look on in our culture that we may think are uh, savage or bizarre, for them... It's just more part of the way of life because uh, in one respect, the jungle is a very beautiful thing. But in another respect, it can be very savage. You know, when a jaguar gets a monkey and tears it apart or, you know, a crocodile or something, you know, it, it's, not, it's merciless in that way. Let's take some calls for you. First time caller, Mike in New York. Let's get us started. Hey, Michael, go ahead. Hey, how you doing? This Good, is Mike. Hi, Mike. Hi. Hey, listen, George. Yeah, I want to tell you I love you. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Because that's the bottom line of saying a compliment, saying that you love somebody, and I don't even know you, okay? But your heart, I feel your heart, and what you do, you're real, you're genuine. You're very kind. Very kind. No, really. Why I'm kind? Because I'm giving back what I've gotten, okay, and blessings, okay? And today is a day for me that you have no idea, okay? It's a, it's the next step to where I have to be, George. And you, I'm going to tell you, people call you and I listen to your show, and they say the compliments, but... The compliment I'm giving you is bottom line. Oh, well, okay, 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 okay. We're we're okay there. So, I I agree, George. You are eminently lovable. I love you too. We all love you too. And you know, one of the things I've learned, and when you break it all down, is that fear is contraction, and love is expansion. And you were talking, you and I were talking about consciousness and does consciousness make you a better person and this and that. And, of course, consciousness is all about expanding awareness and awareness is expansion. And true love, as they say, is unconditional. It it gives unconditionally. And I mentioned the sun. And one of my favorite sayings by uh, Hafiz, either Hafiz or Hafez, I think it's Hafiz, um, 13th century Persian. And he says, even after all this time, the sun never once says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. Yeah, and if it was, if he was Persian, it's probably Hafez. Yeah, I bet you're right. I keep going back and forth. Someday, someday I'll get it right. <laughs> I think they, they have a little skull cap called the Fez, too. Oh, yeah, there you go. You know, that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. So we, you have your conferences. Tell me about them. Yeah, we just did the we just did the fiftieth anniversary this past year of the Santa Barbara Writers Conference. Um, so that will be coming up in June with our uh, next one. We did great this last one. Um, we were just a, a few digits short of selling out, and the tradition has been carried on by Monty Schulz. Um, who was the son of Charles Schultz, um, Charlie Brown Peanuts. Um, Charles Schultz, we always called him Sparky. He came every year. He'd spend his vacation there. He'd spend the week at the conference. That's classic. Yeah. So uh, that one's coming up. And there are um, other smaller events that are coming up. And Santa Barbara is the really big one. Um, It's a a really wonderful one-on-one rubbing your elbows with, you know, very experienced writers of experience. 
Let's go to Cornelius in Alexandria, Louisiana. Hello there, Cornelius. Yeah, I'm surprised you didn't call me Corny, George. I was close. I was close. <laughs> George, I got to tell you a quick story for the coast listeners and stuff. There's a brown dog out here with me, and I gave him some ham, and he's listening to the show, and Matthew and everybody calling and stuff, and he's just wagging his tail like crazy. That's I not a dog. You. That's Tommy. He went to Louisiana <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> That's great, George. I'll have to call Tommy tomorrow and tell him, because we, we need to pray for Tommy. And of course, George told him he was sick, and Jeremy's in the place of him. My question for you, Matthew, they call me the God Guns and Gold Man, the Bible Bullets and Beans Man, and you mo- remarked on this AI technology, and I, I think it's evil myself, and I think we just need to be aware with more consciousness and stuff like that, what you're talking about. Now, I think some people like Brandon and some of these others, they'll take the mark of the beast and they'll put that chip in their head and their brain and everything else so they can become more intelligent. But I think we're more intelligent without those mechanical things. So God bless you, George. God bless Tommy. And God bless Coast to Coast AM. All right, my friend. What do you think of high technology, Matthew? Well, you know, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, one of the things that bothers me a bit these days is younger people on their cell phones. They're out of touch with the natural world. Yeah. And um, I've, I've noticed one of the reasons I'm doing more audio books these days is because younger people just aren't reading. They don't read. I had a couple of my nephews, um, you know, they were going to read a book for me, one of my books, because I wanted to get their input on some stuff about gaming and all that. And I was waiting and waiting for them for like a couple of months. And I'm finally like, you know, hey, guys, what's up? Is, is the book really that horrible? And then the, the older one kind of looks down and he goes, oh, sorry, Uncle Matt, we don't read. I'm like, wow, okay. That is amazing. But yeah, you're yeah. right. Technology so, has done that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it has isolated us. You think about in this day and age with these kids with the with, with the – tablets and the phones and all that, if you stuck them in the middle of the jungle, how long do you think they would last? They wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't know what to eat. They wouldn't know how to survive. One of the things I've done with my nephews is I've taken them out backpacking. Next up, let's go to Tian in Apache Junction, Arizona. Hi, Tian. Go ahead. Hi, George. Hi, Matthew. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Um, Yes, my question tonight is about MDMA and the effects that um well how do you how do you feel about the effects or um with depression or just what are your thoughts on that yeah well so it's an interesting thing mdma is considered to be an empathogen as opposed to a straight out psychedelic and it has qualities it's derived it's technically speaking it's a phenethylamine which is derived from a a cactus like a peyote and san pedro cactus okay have that it's derived from that. It's been very useful in treating PTSD with people, but um, it has potential for abuse. Another interesting thing about it is that it was originally discovered in something like 1865, so they can't patent it. But there have been wonderful, successful stories of people who have done one or two maybe three MDMA sessions with a trained psychologist or a therapist and then followed up with good psychotherapy and they were cured. They, they resolved their issues. But, of course, it can't be patent, patented. So pharmaceutical companies don't want that. They don't want something you could take once or twice. They want you to get you on the Paxil or... Back or, and more and more and more and renewals. Yeah, they want, they, they want your credit card number, right? So they can hit you every month for your prescription. But when used, it's been very effective. A lot of the groundbreaking research was done in, uh, in Israel, of all places, because they had a lot of PTSD issues. And now um, PTSD, and I've done a, a bit of work with PTSD veterans myself, and also people who have suffered um, from domestic abuse PTSD. Yeah. And it has a way of making you feel, uh, it lowers your boundaries, it opens your heart, and makes you feel 
safe and allows you to, to bring out things that you might not necessarily be able to deal with. But you have to be very careful with it. It, it has uh, potential for abuse. And interestingly enough, our, our problem, nationally speaking, in the United States and other places, is that we are getting all these battle-scarred veterans, whether physically or mentally or, or emotionally, with PTSD. And the VA is actually getting more and more flexible, the, vet, you know, the Veterans Administration, about using these because they're Yeah, seeing, they finally realize what's going on. Yeah, it's great results. But it is also among, uh, I mentioned, chem chemically speaking, it's a phenethylamine. It's an amphetamine. It's in the amphetamine family. So you have to be very judicious with it. You have to be very careful. But I think it's a very powerful and effective medicine, and I think that the realities that we're facing with all the, uh, the damage that we're causing for people is making it become more and more necessary to embrace it for a change. You know, just like things that are going on now with the mushrooms and uh, LSD and other the microdosing stuff that's been going on and becoming more and more legal in different places. If you had your way to use the subconscious mind or the unconscious mind, which would it be? Well, it's ultimately the subconscious because the unconscious, technically speaking, from a medical perspective, unconscious, you're out of it. And there's a medical definition of unconscious. If you're, if you're out of it and you're non-responsive, maybe you're breathing, you're considered to be unconscious. You're out of it, yeah. Yeah, but, but then layered over the unconscious is the subconscious. And that's where there's repressed material, but it's there and maybe it, it, it's closer to the surface so it's more accessible. We've got a listener who was in a coma for a couple months, mm. and I'm wondering when you're in that state, if the conscious mind does anything. Are you um, you want my my two cents on that, or real quickly? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know there are there are a lot of reports of people who have been in comas who are who are perfectly conscious and aware. In that state. In that state, but they cannot respond to the outside world. Matthew, is there a way to enhance our consciousness? Any techniques? Yeah, the the, the main one is um, the most common one, I would say, is meditation. And, you know, meditation has to do with quieting your monkey mind because our mind tends to jump around, you know. You can have a million thoughts in a minute sometimes the way it jumps around. So meditation is the practice of developing awareness. And awareness... Um, Another uh, definition of awareness is mindfulness, which is, uh, you know, Buddhist and Hindu traditions. So mindfulness is a practice of bringing our attention into the present moment without evaluating anything. And you can develop it meditating and through other, uh, other type of training. So um, it's a significant element of Hindu and Buddhist traditions, and it's based on the Zen, uh, Zen, I'm sorry, uh, Vipassana, and then there are Tibetan meditation uh, techniques. And, you know, there are nuances to the whole uh, type of definitions about it. But in, in essence, mindfulness is the way out of being caught up in the past and being caught up in the future and staying in the now, because if you're in the now and you're not thinking about what has happened in the past or what might happen to you in the future, which are both distractions, if you're present, you're going to be more aware of your immediate surroundings. Joe in Long Island, New York. Hey, Joseph, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Hi, Matthew. Hi, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. You were talking about wal walnuts for the brain. I just uh, heard of a couple of studies where the pine bark... Uh, can reverse some of the aging neurons in the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have two questions. Uh, first, on the uh, on the actual uh, jungle uh, and consciousness, uh, did you find, like, uh, where, you know, there's almost like a, a fight, flight, or freeze, where people actually freeze up in the jungle, where they should e either, you know, make a motion uh, to attack or retreat. And do you find that there are cognitive biases about even your own behavior and a consciousness that were there that preexisted going into the, the jungle? And then on detecting the shadow, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, do I have a shadow? How do I detect it? 
And uh, do I want to detect it? You know, if you're watching a movie on Freddy Krueger and you either resonate with his character and identify it, that might not be too good. I was thinking of two movies with Matt Damon uh, about the shadow. One was the talented Mr. Ripley Mm -hmm. and then the good shepherd. Both of them, he was kind of a, you know, uh, subterranean uh, underdeveloped psychopath that was kind of under the surface in the character. So it didn't really emerge until later in the movie in the characters that he was depicting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this idea where uh, if you do have this dark side, uh, how do you you really want to retrieve it and and bring it to the open? And just a comment on uh, depression. I was listening to a podcast when when an actress, an interview with an actress, she said she had bouts of depression. And I never heard of this. She would prepare for it. She would buy her groceries, do, uh, you know, stock her shelves or whatever, and do some cleaning, figuring she would have a, a, a bout of depression for like half a week or a week. And she kind of prepare for it. And that was interesting, I thought. Well, you know, um, everybody's different. And without going into a full on dissertation, our brain has levels. We have our primary, it's called the tripartite brain. So our primary brain is reptilian. It's pure instinct and survival. It can be ruthless and cold when it comes to surviving. And it's tied in with fear. And fear has to do with survival. It's a threat to your existence. And so you can lash out strictly to survive. Over that is the next level brain, which is called the neomammalian brain. Then you start getting into more instinctual, not more instinctual because it's instinctual at the core, but more nurturing, more warm-blooded mammalian nurturing. Some reptiles will have their babies and just leave them or they'll lay the eggs, they'll go away. Some of them even eat their babies, right? But when you get into the neomammalian brain, the next level uh, of mammals where there's warm-bloodedness and that kind of a thing, there's more of a nurturing aspect, which also ties into instinct and nurturing. And then, of course, covering over that is the human brain, the outer, the, 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 the highest level brain, where there's logic and the prefrontal cortex is more advanced and you're thinking and all that. But all of it goes back to the core of survival. So when you go through these levels of your mind and you find out where are these instincts coming from, some people are more in tune uh, with others. You can become more caught up in your thoughts and in your head, and you be, you can become more of what's called intellectually centered at the at the risk of uh, overriding other moving body and emotional things. So everybody is a little different in their development, but um, I have a number of books I've written on it. I can even recommend other books written by friends and colleagues of mine that get deep into this, and. You want to, in the in the end, I, I said earlier that fear is contraction and love is expansion. So if you have this fear and you can get down to where it's coming from, you can discover things and you can grow and you can expand and become more out of it. Just a little side note, when I first went into the jungle, I was terrified of the bugs. I mean, I was terrified and I realized over time that I got that fear from my mother. My mother was terrified. Were of they bugs. all over the place or are you just afraid of the bugs? A little bit of both. The very first time I went into the jungle and I walked in, I got I, we walked into a hornet's nest. I got stung by 11 uh, wasps. Oh, wow, that should have killed you. It could have, um, but my adrenaline was on high, and uh, and it was a battle. And then another time, that same time, I was I was eating one time, and I opened my mouth to eat, and this wasp flew right into my mouth and stung the heck out of the inside of my mouth. But I realized that that deep fear that I had is something I got from my mother. So you learn when you go and you realize that that you have to respect some bugs. You don't know if they're going to sting you or if they're poisonous or this or that, but you realize their place in nature and what they do, and when you have more awareness of them, then you're not going to react strictly from instinct and fear. When you wrote the book uh, a couple years ago, Holographic Cosmic Man, tell me what got you uh, interested in that. I came to the realization, I I love sacred geometry, and I came to the realization that the golden mean 
which is the golden cut 1.618, is actually the perfect mathematical representation of a hologram. And when you study it and you realize it's all throughout nature and it's all throughout our body, our belly button is at 1.618, that, that division in our body. If you look at the joints of your finger from the end of it to the next one, that relationship between the fingertip and the next joint is the golden mean. And those two, and next to the next section, is also the golden mean. And it's also the basis of the Fibonacci spiral, which is how plants grow, flowers grow. You can see it in, in uh, the patterns of sunflowers, um, in pine cones, throughout nature. The way that a plant grows and the way the, 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 the leaves come up toward the sun, it follows a pattern. It's a Fibonacci spiral. It's called phyllotaxis, which gives each leaf maximum exposure to the sun as the plant grows up. So I saw it everywhere, and I saw the same thing in the pattern of a sunflower that I did see in the cosmos throughout. And, and the, 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 uh, a, a perfect hurricane forms uh, in a Fibonacci spiral. It sure when does. When you look at it, it's like when you buy a new car. You know, I, I have, my Prius is older now, but when I bought my Prius and I thought it was great, suddenly I saw Priuses everywhere, right? So when you start to recognize <laughs> yeah. these patterns within nature – and you see that they're everywhere, and you realize that it's inside of all of us in many different ways, and it's also throughout the natural world everywhere we look. Exactly. Matthew, thanks for being on the program. Keep in touch. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.